Welcome to Harlow on Healthcare. I'm David Harlow, and I invite you to join me by my virtual hearth as I sit down with healthcare leaders to discuss building the future of healthcare. Today, my guest is Dave Chase, founder of the Health Rosetta Institute. Previously, Dave founded Microsoft's partner ecosystem, a $2 billion business, and he founded Avado, which was later acquired and integrated into the Web, MD, and Medscape properties. At the Health Rosetta Institute, Dave is focused on the problem that the healthcare industry has become an extractive business. As he likes to say, we didn't get better lighting by optimizing oil lamps, so we need a new paradigm for healthcare. We need to identify and scale successes that deliver on the quadruple aim the improved population health, more cost-effective care, better patient satisfaction, and better health care provider satisfaction as well. Dave, welcome, and thank you for joining me at Harlow on Healthcare. Well, thanks a lot for having me, David. When I re-entered healthcare, yours was one of the first blogs that I started regularly reading to kind of get myself reacquainted with what's going on. So real pleasure to be on your show. Well, thank you. I I appreciate that, Dave. And uh, you have certainly done your share of writing. Uh, I would direct people to LinkedIn and elsewhere to see your posts on the problems in healthcare, some of the solutions that are out there, and of course, the book that you've recently published on the topic as well. As I've first seen your writing on the topic, you've really focused on the quadruple aim in healthcare. And now I see you shifting focus a a bit in order to zoom in on one particular area where you seem to be convinced is an area where we need to start if we want to achieve solutions in, in this realm. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about your focus on the quadruple aim and the shift to where you are today, or whether you see it as a shift. Maybe you don't. Well, it's kind of an evolution um, in that as I started, um, I mean, part how I came on the the quadruple aim just was observing the highest performing organizations. And it turned out they were always focusing on that fourth and forgotten aim, uh, caring for the care team. Uh, But then as I looked at uh, the problem and the many problems in healthcare, Virtually every time that I did that and started peeling away the layers of the onion, it always came back to we just purchase healthcare really poorly in this country, um, and virtually you know it's essentially the root cause issue of all the dysfunction that I was seeing. And so then you look at that and say, okay, well who's doing the purchasing? And yes, it's the government, uh, but if you're not elderly or if you're not low income, overwhelmingly, you get your benefits through your employment in the U.S. It's one of the uh, unique attributes of our system. And, uh, you know, really across the board, but but uh, no worse than in the employer space, we just do a terrible job of it. And, and I realize if we don't fix that, all the things that we all care about from interoperability and patient empowerment uh, would be near impossibilities. We might be able to do some things on the margins, but not make the wholesale change that many of us believe are necessary to have a much better health ecosystem. Right, well, it ultimately makes a whole heck of a lot of sense, Dave, that you, if you empower the purchaser of healthcare services and the ultimate purchaser here, or at least the immediate purchaser for many, is the self-insured employer, uh, empowering that purchaser is going to lead to change where otherwise the problem is too diffuse. Uh, Are are there particular areas that you see as ripe for reform in the hands of a well-informed self-insured employer? Well, the two biggest problems that, you know, are in healthcare that aren't unique to the employer are pricing failure that is that there's no correlation between what you pay and the value you get in return. And if there's a correlation, it's inversely proportional. Uh, and then secondly, over treatment. 
And in both of those areas, there's a lot of opportunity. Take the pricing failure. There are just an incredible number of absurd examples to where it's really essentially the rule is vastly overpaying. Things like PPO networks, which you know, uh, from their inception made sense, but they've lost their way. Now, you know, to be in a PPO network from an employer perspective is to pay for the privilege of massively overpaying. And so what you see smart purchasers do, and it's not just private sector employers, you, there's activity in California with CalPERS, which is their retirement system, doing things like reference-based pricing where they pay some multiple of Medicare since all the providers are, uh, provider organizations are responsible for reporting costs. And, you know, typically you'll see in these reference-based pricing, they'll pay maybe 130% or 150% of Medicare. So it's, it's well above what they've accepted for Medicare payment. But too often what you find is employers are spending 250% or even 1,000% of Medicare for no apparent reason other than they're asleep at the wheel. Right. And I, I think you've you've written about this, and we've heard this from other observers uh, as well, that in the on the part of employers, this sort of failure, this uh, being asleep at the wheel is – in a sense, uh, a breach of a fiduciary duty under ERISA. Uh, Employers have a responsibility to manage employee benefit plans responsibly. And this sort of outsourcing of thinking about healthcare really is at odds with that sort of responsibility. Yeah. And historically, you know, ERISA oversees two areas, retirement benefits and health benefits. And I think this is a mistaken uh, scenario, you know, up or a uh, situation, but I think it wasn't applied in healthcare area because it was viewed as the employer's money as opposed to the employee's money. Because you know, in the 401k arena, if you're as an employer putting your employee's money into a, you know, Uncle Bubba's investment fund that's got high fees and terrible returns, uh, you are obviously not stewarding the employee's money as you should. Uh, And now that, you know, I would argue is always the employee's money, and that's certainly what the law says. But now that you have the vast majority of people have very significant co-pays and deductibles and quite high deductibles, it's clearly the employee's money. Typically, it's a 70-30 split employer-employee. And with that comes a, a duty that is very well spelled out. And you see areas like in the 401k arena where cases have gone all the way to the Supreme Court as a class action on behalf of employees and unanimously uh, winning you know, on a part of the employees. Now you're starting to see that type of activity in the healthcare arena. It's just early days, uh, but it's definitely happening. I'm aware of dozens of very significant cases that haven't been filed, um, but they're definitely in the works. And what's notable is when big four risk managers say this is the largest undisclosed risk they've seen in their career and their audit counterparts are metaphorically pushing away from the table and saying, we won't sign these financials if there's not an allowance for the ERISA fiduciary risk. That's a big deal. Um, And when companies start managing it carefully, it's just a completely different dynamic. I mean, it's kind of absurd if you think about it. Companies will balk at a missing $62 restaurant receipt on some expense report while they'll blindly pay a $100,000 claim for something that should have cost $2,000. And if you look at the I often I tweeted recently confused by the news, uh, and then I had some stats on how um, much economic distress the you know majority of Americans are under the working and middle class, and the data is exceptionally clear. That's ninety five percent 
due to healthcare costs. And so that's why I see this really growing as an issue and, you know, I'm making people aware of that. I'm adding a chapter in my book on this issue, actually. Right. Yeah. So it's it's the employees out of pocket expenses, but it's also uh, what you're describing as a tremendous uh, in- inappropriate spend or misspend of the employer contribution. And, and in part, I believe you're saying an overspend of the employer contribution as well, which could certainly go for other uses, whether whether it's other sorts of compensation or benefits to employees or other sorts of investment in employers' businesses. Uh, what I hear you saying loud and clear is that it's being overspent on health care. Dollars could be better put to use elsewhere. Yeah, and that's what you see the smart employers doing. You know, they're able to give people significant raises. And, you know, the underlying dynamic here is I actually have a chapter in my book on this that was contributed by um, former New York Times uh, editor who really looks at the uh, the kind of real market in healthcare in terms of what the real price is. And other than some specialty drugs, the underlying healthcare costs have not gone up in five or 10 years in the real market. Um, and the, of course, the underlying costs are why that is. And that's, and when I say the real market, this is, this is where people are either directly contracting between an employer and a provider organization or a cash pay situation. Um, yet most of us are in what I believe is a rigged market uh, where the way things have been structured, costs continue to go up and up and up for no real reason other than they can get away with it. Um, and as long as they're allowed to get away with it, they will get away with it. Right, a continuing problem. Well, if you're just tuning in, this is Harlow on Healthcare coming to you on Healthcare Now Radio. I'm David Harlow, and my guest today is Dave Chase, co founder of the Health Rosetta Institute. We're talking about a number of things today, including lessons presented and drawn from his recent book, The CEO's Guide to Restoring the American Dream. Dave, you've recently written that the future of healthcare is local, open, and decentralized. I wonder if you could expound on what you mean by that and how those characteristics of the future of healthcare can come to improve the scenario that you've been describing. Yeah, I mean, I'm drawing on some outstanding work by a gentleman named Chris Brookfield and his work in doing large-scale system change and, and then collaborating with him on applying this into healthcare. And his work has been instrumental in lifting tens of millions of people out of poverty in India. And then after returning to the U.S., involved in remaking the U.S. food system. And what that means is local is, well, first of all, healthcare is a fundamentally local relationship transaction, if you want to call it that, where local individual is receiving care from a local nurse and doctor and so on. Yet there's all kinds of money handlers that get in between and extract money and send it outside the community. And it never returns, basically. And so local is important because when you look at these complex problems like food or like healthcare, when you look at the large scale, they seem kind of too complicated to solve. But when you actually break it down to a local level and decrease the scale, solutions appear to the problems that seem too complicated at a global scale. And so that's one thing that's certainly been in my observations. I've kind of scoured the country for what's already working. That's certainly been the case. Openness is key too. And openness, not just from a, what you think of as a technology perspective, but realizing that when you have very entrenched competitors, I mean, one of my favorite examples is the craft brewing industry. They're a very open, collaborative industry, and that's allowed them to, in the face of a couple dominant players, grab a significant toehold in otherwise flat industry and continue to grow. And so that certainly underlies the Health Rosetta project that I've been working on, that openness is really an advantage because information networks have coalesced over the past 15 years that's exponentially increased the flow of information. You just haven't seen that happen in healthcare. And so, 
you know, open in the way that like Wikipedia is open. We're doing that. And the reality is there's no way to transmit proprietary ideas anywhere near the speed and the coverage when you open source an idea. And that's one way when there's three trillion reasons protecting the status quo, you can diffuse the impact widely and you find particular areas bubbling up. And, and I don't care whether somebody is in, you know, Boston or Bulgaria, if they've got the best idea on how to address a particular thing, let's learn it about it, prove it out, replicate it, propagate it. And that's where open really comes in. And then decentralized is key where you can get the combined benefit of kind of a locality, but with also the kind of scale economies. Chris's team is doing that very successfully in the food arena. And I believe the same opportunity exists here. And one reason you haven't seen it as much in healthcare is traditional venture capital approaches always look for scalability. What matters here is replicability. The impact ultimately can be as big or bigger, but everybody is trying to grow, grow, grow rather than replicate, replicate, replicate. So that's where we see that. And there's an incredible spirit of collaboration, an area, for example, that I've study a lot is direct primary care. And you kind of have that same dynamic as the craft brewing industry where they're getting together, they're sharing ideas, here's what work, here's the obstacles we're running into. And that's how you drive large scale system change. And, you know, we're already seeing it just in the couple months since we've launched the certification program for benefits consultants. We already have folks representing, I think about 4 million lives which is, you know, still got a long ways to go. But in two months, that's not too bad because of that spirit of collaboration and decentralization that encourages people to really to share. Right. It is the question of being able to replicate rather than scale outward from a single point. Uh, As you mentioned, the direct primary care model, they're also the workplace clinic sort of model of of services that has done, I think, tremendous service in terms of reducing costs, uh, spending more money on preventive care and ultimately less money overall, right? Whether yeah. it's, um, I think you had some stories about that in the book as well, the ability to establish workplace clinics that are ultimately not only a saving to the employer, but ultimately a uh, benefit, well, if you have the right kind of employer who's willing to invest in the community, a benefit to the local community as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was talking to some primary care folks because I've been such a big advocate of that. As you study the world, you basically, it's very clear you can't have a high-function health care system without high-function primary care. And we've done everything imaginable to undermine primary care in this country. I, and I told them, I, I mentioned primary care 56 times in the book. That's how important <laughs> one of the other right. one of the other things that you got to get right. And we've really botched it and just turn primary care into kind of milk in the back of the store to, you know, refer people to high margin stuff rather than in a high function place with a comprehensive primary care, they can address 92% of the issues that people come into the healthcare system for, which is certainly what you don't typically see here in the U.S. Do you think that we have identified the healthcare problem as a political problem? to our detriment or to the de- to the detriment of those of us who, who want to solve the problem that is out there? Does it need to be redefined as a business problem? I don't know if it's a, a business problem that could, you know, business problem, it's a community problem, but yet the short answer is yes. And there's no better way to freeze the status quo in any industry, healthcare included, than to politicize it. That's just, and when things get politicized in healthcare, you know, those trying to preserve this, the wildly underperforming status quo are kind of winning and are pulling that off. And so what you see in these communities is when a movement's really ready for development in a particular commercial sphere, once it ceases to be viewed as political, And when it's political, there's insufficient agreement, the community itself is split, and that, and consequently, the commercial development is doomed. But when it's obvious, you know, in the case of, you know, in the past, things like microcredit and local food and in pockets now in healthcare, that virtually everyone in the local community uh, agrees with the underlying premise of 
where things need to go. And that's part of the reason why we've published this blueprint and this kind of vision, this health 3.0 vision, that's kind of the North star and the, the health Rosetta is kind of a, a roadmap or travel tips on how to get there. That's when commercial values align with community business models. And that's where you're able to attract, you know, virtually unanimous support. And, you know, in my uh, travels and study in the country, what's interesting is you find conservatives implementing so-called progressive ideas and progressives implementing so-called conservative ideas. And those are just a good example of how when you get down to that local community level, people want to just solve problems. And when they can get past the politicization, uh, that's when things really get done. Sure. Well, that's encouraging when when people can get practical as opposed to uh, uh, um, uh, focused on their positions and political positions. Um, in, in the realm of of finger pointing, I think uh, one issue that's been on many people's minds has been the opioid crisis in this country. And there are a lot of finger pointing going on. And some folks point the finger at pharma companies. Some folks point the finger at employers. I wonder where you come down in this debate. Yeah, I've looked at this a lot. Um, And what I found is, first of all, the issue is getting greatly oversimplified. Um, And it's going to make it very difficult to solve if we don't actually understand the full breadth. I found so far 12 major drivers of the opioid crisis. And when you look at that, Um, just as any addict needs an enabler, the employers are actually the primary enabler on 11 of those 12 uh, drivers. And so, yes, government needs to be involved, but it's necessary, but wildly insufficient. Um, It's not like things like polio or HIV or, you know, Zika or something like that, where primarily a government-led thing is going to solve it. And the silver lining on this, but also something that gives you pause is, you know, when you, when there was events like Katrina, you know, after the human tragedy of Katrina, there was a lot of innovation in uh, environmental building and there was a lot of efforts around education. And I think that's the silver lining here is a lot of these communities have been devastated just as much as New Orleans was. And, And so when you actually solve the opioid crisis, that happens with a community-wide effort. Community is sort of the antidote, if you will, for it. You actually go a long ways towards solving the larger healthcare dysfunction. Uh, That's also why it's a tough problem to solve is it is a multifaceted solution and problem. Um, And so that's where the employers need to, to step it up. Uh, when I don't, th- I mean, they've been unwitting accomplices to this, but they need to realize this is a big challenge for them and their communities, and it is solvable, but not with just doing some tweaks on the edges. Right. It's going to require a significant investment in all sorts of response modalities, uh, including counseling and long term investment in communities, as you described. Yeah, I mean, the the visual metaphor that I've used is there's this um, sketch of some clinicians mopping up a wet floor. And we do need a lot of mops, uh, given the scale of this crisis. Um, But meanwhile, in the background, the sink's running over and the spigot's running full blast. And unfortunately, we're getting better at mopping um, and being aware of, of, you know, good approaches to, quote, mopping. Uh, but the spigot's still running full blast, and so we got to turn off the spigot as well. Um, and that's really a big focus of um, what I've been studying and writing of late. I'm going to add to the book is how what is the antidote? And it is a frankly, it's a high function healthcare system. And sadly, the opioid crisis shouldn't be viewed as an anomaly, but a logical byproduct of a very dysfunctional healthcare system. I see. So Dave, our last quick question for you is this. I know you, you're a self-described oxygen-fueled athlete, 
And uh, after a long day out in the field, I'm sure you like to get a good night's sleep. But I'm going to ask you if you if you found yourself waking up five years in the future, what is one thing in healthcare or in health benefits that you would expect to find has changed drastically? Well, I'm a congenital optimist, and so I'll take a aspirational view, which I think is possible. I want employers to walk the talk of that cliche, our employers are our greatest asset. Because when today, you know, they're investing in the equivalent of toxic mortgage, mortgages with the status quo, there's financial toxicity leading to medical toxicity. And we talked about the quad aim earlier. You go through that quad aim, which is always the filter for me. And You know, today we have care team burnout and even suicide. Doctors have the highest rate of suicide of any profession. Patient front, the patient experience, got the lowest net promoter score of any industry in the health insurance industry. And outcomes, you know, we've got, we talked about the opioid crisis. You know, the third leading cause of death is preventable medical mistakes. And when it comes to spending, you know, we've got this long economic depression. And so I think there's, there's awareness of these things that now people are taking action. I mentioned the the level of recep, you know, reception we've gotten, which is amazing. So I'm quite bullish that where you know today we have about four million lives represented in the benefits consultants on board. I think we can see ten times that in another five years, given the momentum we have, and. That is what I hope for. That's what I expect. That's what I'm seeing. Um, it's easy to miss that because it's diffuse, but believe me, it's happening in a big way. That's a vision of the future that we hope we can all strive for and achieve. Well, it's been a pleasure. You can find Dave Chase online, follow his writing on LinkedIn or via Twitter at Chase Dave, and don't forget healthrosetta.org. You have been listening to Harlow on Healthcare. Join us at healthcarenowradio.com. Let's continue the conversation on building the future of healthcare together at hashtag Harlow on HC. I'm David Harlow, keeping the fire going and holding a seat open for you. Until next time. Mm-hmm.